All right, guys, welcome back to Small Talk. Now, for those who don't know what Small Talk is, is a segment under Den of Truth where we invite guests to talk about financial literacy, business, startups, politics, economics, social issues, a whole bunch of information that is going to give you some practical steps that you can take ownership in your life. Um, and, you know, the whole aim of this is, yeah, we want to expose young people all across communities um, to, you know, be exposed to new information that is going to inspire you guys to take practical steps, take some accountability, some ownership, and hopefully, you know, inspire the next generation to become leaders and you know, they pass down that knowledge to their kids as well and just create a better society. So recently, um, I've read a statistic that really surprised me, right? And it's, you know, I'll, I'll read it out, is that Aussies, waste 140,000 tons of hardware and just technology um, each year and only 12% of it gets recycled. So, you know, that it makes me think, you know, in an age of consumerism to overconsumption and wastage, what are you doing with your phones and your laptops? I mean, some of us, you know, buy phones every year. Some of us have laptops every year and we just renew it every three years or so. What are you doing? Is it just sitting in your desk collecting dust? Is it you're just chucking in a bin or, you know, are you not recycling it? And we feel like it makes me think, you know, what can we actually do or you know, what can be done better? Because there's a lot of people out there who need technology, right, in underprivileged communities. And today we have someone that has established a startup uh, that addresses this issue and is driving a positive impact for um, you know, a lot of communities to have equitable access to these, um, you know, this, to this technology, and that's driving a positive impact. And you know, he's not only not defined by that one startup; he's also doing another startup on top of that. Is someone that has left a nine to five and has done his own thing. Uh, he's the co-founder and CEO of Zolo, and he's also the chief marketing officer of a startup called OJazz. Today we have Franz here, Sat. How you doing, my brother? Good, man. Pleasure to be here. Hey, I'm excited. Appreciate you coming on. Now, I just want to get straight into it, man. Um, you know, a lot of people who come from this community, where we come from, where Southwest Sydney to uh, similar communities all across Australia and the world, um, there's a lot of uh, lack of information, right? Mm. There's a lot of lack of accessibility to things that we wouldn't have compared to peers outside of totally. where we come from. And, you know, listening to your journey, it's uh, it's interesting. I've read about it, but i love if you can just introduce yourself. Uh, hopefully I've done a good job about it. But... That was a good intro, by <laughs> the way. You. you made me look good. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, uh, I want to hear from yourself, you know, can you introduce us about, you know, your background, yeah. your career, and, you know, how'd you come about to the stage that you're at now? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, first of all, yeah, like I said, it's good to uh, it's good to be here. You know, just to have a conversation around um, financial literacy because I think that needs to be dialed up in terms of um, the youth and millennials and Gen Gen Z. In terms of that needs to be very that's an important uh, topic to discuss um, and often neglected. So it's a, it's an honor to kind of shed some light and share somehow my experience um, when it comes to that. Um, I suppose in terms of my background. Um, I came from a nine to five background, as you know. Um, so I finished uni, I studied marketing. So I've always been passionate about um, marketing and communications, advertising, storytelling, to be precise. Um, and I started my career, career at Optus. Um, so I was part of their marketing team for five years. Started in the in the retail marketing team. So that was like my first gig at um, at Optus, fresh out of university, and. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I was super fresh, you know, I was super fresh, um, very naive, but there's always been this level of curiosity that I have. And um, and I think that was critical in terms of my growth and progression within the um, within the business is I was just curious, like I was never the smartest individual ever, you know, and. I used to fear public speaking as well. Um, in, the, in a corporate environment, that's a super important skill to have because that's kind of how you can articulate your thoughts in whatever it may be. And that's how you get job done is to, through communication. Yeah. Yeah. And I suck at communicating. Um, like I get stage fright when I speak to someone. So that was kind of like my first two years at Optus is trying just to navigate my way through that and try to build my confidence. Um, and yeah, I think... Um, 
I did all various marketing practices um, at Optus. So I did retail marketing, did digital marketing, brand, um, so on and so forth. So that's kind of how my journey began, uh, began in marketing at Optus. And yeah. Nice, man. And, and um, we'll definitely get through. Mm. Um, you know, obviously, you left, your, you did that for a number of years and then you moved to um, you know, doing your own thing, right? Yeah. But, before we even get to that, um, a lot of kids and a lot of people, you know, who are still in high school, mm. uh, who are trying to get to uni, yes, um, you know, they still are doing a bachelor of business, maybe a bachelor of, of commerce or whatever, yeah. um, and you know, a lot of these people want to get into marketing, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, before we get to the, the beyond the nine to five, you know, when we say retail marketing or digital marketing, you know, can you? you know, break down, I guess, what are some of the things that you're doing on a day-to-day basis at Optus? Because, you know, there could be someone who's trying to break into yeah. a corporate job right now. Yeah, That's the first course. step before yeah. they realize something else, right? Yeah. But what's, you know, if you can divulge a little bit into, you know, what marketing entails and what are some of the things you're doing, maybe yeah. that could give kids an idea yeah, yeah. of, you know, what could be possible as a career option yeah, as well. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, so first of all, I did marketing in university because that was the easiest. Um, <laughs> that <laughs> well, was, the, maths. <laughs> that was the easiest degree yeah. to get into. Um, I barely passed. I, th- I think um, I kind of can't even remember what I got from my HSC. Yeah. But um, yeah, marketing was like the, the easiest entry point to to get a university degree. Yeah. And um, so let's get let's just get that out of the way. Um, and then yeah, I think in my first gig at Optus, it was retail marketing. So basically, Optus, they have 350 stores across the country. And if I don't know if you've been to an Optus store. Yeah, so, you know, you have all the, the marketing materials um, the in the store, all the storage. collateral and stuff. Yeah. Um, so basically just pulling them together. It, pretty much I was the middleman between the store mm. and also the agents, the creative agency that we work with and also the product teams within Optus. So it's a lot of, it's a collaborative approach to kind of deliver one deliverable, if that makes sense yep. um, so I was accountable for delivering campaigns within within the retail space um, and at the same time making sure that the, the offers and the products and the services of Optus mm-hmm. are brought to life in a way that it will be received positively by customers yeah um, so that's what um what was the second question <laughs> no, no that, that was the question man it's just yeah. like what does it entail yeah uh, your role so um, if I was to summarize and put a very high level for, for kids out there, mm. it's like uh, basically understanding what is happening on the ground and yeah. what customers are saying, what totally. they're demanding, yeah. and identifying some market signals in which yes, you create sure. that content yeah. to make yeah. it more relevant on future campaigns yes. and in-store experiences yes. so that yeah. you increase consumer, yeah. uh, basically increase consumption and sales. Correct. Yes. Like. Yeah, but that's a look. That's one career option that kids can take. You know, yeah. to get into marketing. But I'm more interested, man. Like the fact that you went from a nine to five, and uh, now you've transitioned to doing uh, Zola as a startup, but also yeah. the fact that you're doing uh, OJAZ as well. But before we even get to that, it's like, how did you? move from a nine to five mindset yeah. to, to thinking, I want to do my own thing. I mm. want to have some ownership. Yes. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned that you went through a sabbatical when we're talking offline. So walk us through the process yeah. of yeah, the mindset shifting from nine to five to doing, taking a sabbatical, how important that yeah. was to how do you find your purpose to totally. think about yeah. these two things? Yeah. I love how you mentioned purpose because that was like the, the core as to why I um, kind of took that leap of faith. So yeah, like I said, I was at Optus for five years and within those five years, my priority was just climbing the ladder, was climbing the corporate ladder yeah. to the point where I alienated everything and everyone. My focus was just to get that next promotion, to get that next promotion, um, which is a good and unhealthy behavior to have. I think it's a good thing because it taught me discipline and I was able to say no, you know, I was in my early 20s during that time, and I never partied, yeah, yeah. I never partied. Um, yeah, I think I was 23, 24 when I first started my corporate career, and I think most people during, you know, uh, when you're in your early 20s, I think they tend to go out, they tend to have yeah, fun, which isn't, I'm not condemning that, but I think my priority at that time was, I was so laser focused on climbing that ladder, and everything that has nothing to do with that, Never had time for it. I did not make time for Um I never dated um, in my early 20s just because it was a distraction. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was just my priority was to climb the ladder, climb the, ra- climb the ladder, get a, get a promotion, 
whatever it takes. Um, and I think that has some sort of a negative um, impact um, in terms of how other people perceive me within the um, within the organization, um, because I think I think I was I was a pleasure to work with, um, yeah. but I think I had different priorities. I just want to make sure that I get the credit. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I can't believe I'm sharing this, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that I get the credit, I get the recognition, and also I work on the high level campaigns. Yeah, um, and I was fortunate because um, you know I, I worked on the. Optus's kind of Super Bowl campaigns, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's um, I'm very grateful for that because that gave me a lot of exposure to the executives within the uh, within the business, and at the same time, um, it was good for my personal branding within within the organization. Yeah. So that was like my first four four years um, at Optus. I was just grinding, um, and I was having fun doing it as well. You know, um, I think when you achieve something. When you set a goal and you achieved it, um, that was kind of become an obsession for me. So that was um, that was my first four years in the in the corporate world, and I suppose part of my part of growth. Everyone goes through it. Part of growth and maturity is your perspective in life would change. Um, and I think year four at Optus, that's when it started to, hmm, there must be something. Um, outside and way bigger than just selling phones. <laughs> Basically, that's all we did. We just sold, we just sold phones. Yeah. Um, so I kind of um, went through that journey and I was unhappy. I, I went through depression as well. Um, and I didn't know why I wasn't feeling well. I wasn't feeling, I wasn't there, you know. Um, I was unhappy. I was sad. Um, performance at work has declined. I was ticking boxes. I was just mm -hmm. ticking boxes, you know. I wasn't going over and above. Um, I think it was a big um, effort for me just to get out of bed, yep. um, and I was out of character. You know, I used to be very excited, very enthusiastic about work, about performing. Um, but yeah, year four to five, I was just demo I lost completely, lost motivation, mm -hmm. um, and I think um, I didn't know what was happening. I was very unsure of what was ha uh, what was happening. But long story short. Um, I was going through this mental uh, mental health um, journey that mm. I wasn't aware of because I think I grew up in a very conservative Filipino family where mental health wasn't uh, wasn't taught, um, and I'm sure a lot of people can resonate with that, especially people in ma in our generation yeah. where you just got to man up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was that was kind of like my approach early way back in the day in my early twenties. Not really back in the day. Just a couple of years ago, <laughs> well, only twenty nine. Um, yeah, that was we were taught just to man up, you know, yeah. just to man up and just um, move on, which is a which is a good thing to kind of have because it teaches you to 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 persevere. But I think um, there's a level of bravery if you just put your hand up and just acknowledge that mm. things are not okay. So I reached that point where I had to acknowledge that things that are not okay. And um, a friend of mine, I, and I, was, you know, I, I chatted with a friend of mine and explained to her what was happening. Um, she referred me to a therapist. So, um, and I, at first I was very reluctant. Again, growing up in a very conservative family, um, I was like, I don't want to, I'm not crazy. You know? yeah. <laughs> That's often the, um, that, the stigma. You know, the stigma, exactly. Yeah. So when someone sees a therapist, it just shows that, oh, you're crazy. You have issues. Um, it's true. Yeah. You know, I was crazy and I had issues, but um, everyone goes through it. And I think we should um, we should do our part and embrace that. If we have um, flaws, issues, or craziness in us, I think that needs to be addressed. Mm. And at the same time, that needs to be acknowledged because um, the only time you can actually break through off that is through acknowledging yeah. and working through it. So um, I'm very grateful for my friend who kind of shed some light when it comes to seeing a therapist as part of my mental health journey. So I ended up seeing one. Um, and I think the reason why I was feeling that type of way, I was feeling I was feeling terrible, actually, um, is because um, because of my values. Mm. Um, it started off with the, the value system. What I've discovered is growth at that time. Growth was the most important thing for me. I need to be in an environment where I'm growing. I need to be surrounded by people um, that push me to grow. 
Um, I just need to make sure that I'm always growing, always getting better, development, so on and so forth. Um, and the reason why I was feeling depressed is because I was no longer getting that in my nine to five job. Right. Because I've kind of plateaued. Yeah. Where I wasn't, I wouldn't say I wasn't giving up, given opportunities. I've kind of became a spoiled brat where I just expect to work on the, the high level yeah. campaigns. Yeah. And, and I'm not proud of that behavior actually because, um, it yeah i was i was quite arrogant about it too yeah to the point that i rebelled um rebelled meaning you know i was just ticking boxes and just going with the flow um and if i was working on a campaign that wasn't high level yeah i didn't i was like i didn't care yeah. <laughs> i could say that now you can't fire me yeah. i left <laughs> um so the yeah, that was the um, that was kind of like the situation that I was in. I wasn't growing, yeah. and now that I've identified that, okay, I know that um, in order for me to be happy, in order for my potential to be maximized, and in order for me to just um, live a comfortable life mentally, I need to make some tweaks in the environment that I'm in. So. Um, that was like a 12 month journey. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't quit straight away. <laughs> that was like in year four at Optus. Yeah. And then on the on the fifth year, this was 2020 during the lockdown and the first iteration of the lockdown. <laughs> um, that's when um, I realized that, okay, um, everything was just on hold. You know, the world, everyone stopped. Um, and it kind of changed my perspective in life in terms of what's really important. Um, you know, you see these people um, who've lost their livelihood because of because of COVID. Um, and for us, I was, you know, we had the luxury to work from home and at the same time get compensated um, mm. for doing so. Um, and I think that the first um, the first lockdown kind of um, the time that I had to myself in terms of just self-reflection um, made me realize that um, I, I got to do something about this. Yeah. Um, I think something needs to change because I was really unhappy. Um, I was feeling very unfulfilled in what I'm doing. Suicid suicidal thoughts were there too. Um, not that I was actually going to do it, but I think it's um, oftentimes we kind of just think about it, yeah. you know, because because of the situation that we're in, whatever situation you guys are in. Um, and it all stemmed from being unhappy, um, discontent. Um, so long story short, um, I made a decision prior to making a decision, pulled out a spreadsheet, make sure that I can afford <laughs> having no revenue stream. Yeah. Um, and I had like six months to survive of not having income coming in. Yeah. So I was pretty, I was like, oh, shit, I can live off my savings for six months, but I have to be very disciplined. You know, I can't go out for dinners and lunches, so on and so forth. So um, I did all, I did my homework. So if someone's watching this, this, um, this interview um, and thinking of resigning your nine to five job, I think you got you have to do your homework first in terms of making sure that you can survive afford, for six months. You, you can survive for X amount of months. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was the first thing that I did. Um, otherwise, and I would have stayed. You know, no, hundred <laughs> percent. I feel like um, it's it's really important. It's it's um, and thanks for sharing that, man. Mm. I feel like it's important that we talk about mental health. Yes, uh, especially where you know where we come from. Like you mentioned before, man. Yeah. Uh, even just the cultural aspect of it, where you know where we come from in in, in you know western sydney or so it's just a stigma attached to right. even expressing yourself because yeah. you got a man up totally uh to the fact that you know even reinforced yeah. by an asian culture where yeah. we don't even talk about mental health because mm. that's stigmatized on top of that as yes. well it makes it really hard for you to even express your mm. emotions right and yeah i feel like um i feel like a lot of people where we come from in our culture they were just traumatized man yeah. it's the fact that we experience trauma. We've seen things that we shouldn't see, or just the mm. fact that we haven't expressed it. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people just don't know how to to even to share that to someone so yeah. that it heals. Um, yes. And I'm glad that you know that we're talking about where you know we it shouldn't be a stigma. It should be a thing where you're able to talk to someone about it because mm. that's how you work through things, and that's how yeah. I assume they led you to identify with your therapist that. Um, it's a from a cultural value perspective, right? Totally. I need to have values that align to mm. the stage where I'm at in life. Yes. And if I don't align with it, I'm going to be unhappy. Yes. Um, 
and that's kind of led you to to the point where my nine to five isn't giving me the support system yeah. that I need, or it's not giving me the, uh, I guess, the growth yes. that I required. Yeah. So you know, walking through that. Um, you know, you set yourself up. Obviously, uh, very good practical advice is that mm. you, know, you got to have a six month emergency fund. Yeah, at least six months. <laughs> at least six at months least six to months. survive if you quit your job. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, walk me through, I guess, how did you recalibrate? You know, what sort of value? Yeah, you know, growth is a big thing, mm. right? But, yes. you know, what were the pillars of, of growth that you were looking for? And how did you uh, figure out your purpose, which yeah. has led you to. Um, yeah, Zerlo and yeah. also also Ojaz. Yeah, yeah. So I think growth. Yeah, to your point, growth is super important for me. And as part of growth, there's like a complementary component that is important for me as well, and that's autonomy. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, unfortunately, if you're working in a nine to five environment, you kind of don't have autonomy because you gotta you gotta check with this person, routine, you gotta, you gotta check that five. person. Um, it's uh, it's a it's a whole new operation. So I think autonomy for me was important, and I've identified that. And I think before I was kind of avoiding that it's important for me because it shows that I'm not a team player. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think. I made the the bold and brave decision where, all right, I just got to, this is where I want to be in life, right? What do I need to accept? What are the things that I need to get rid of um, in order to kind of break through and and achieve the the goals? Um, And one of them is really accepting that autonomy is super important for me. Um, But I just don't want to make sure, sometimes autonomy has a negative connotation behind it because it shows that you're a control freak. Yeah. Um, But I think being, you know, having the desire to to do something where you have 100 percent autonomy um, just shows that, you know, you really care about what you are doing. Mm. Um, It doesn't it doesn't. It's not a reflection of selfishness or or whatnot. I think it just shows a level of care. You want to have control in your life. You want to have totally. ownership in your yeah, life. Yeah, you want to you want to dictate how you want to live your life. Yeah. You know, um, and how you want to progress career wise as well. I think um, oftentimes in again in the nine to five industry where they always tell us that oh you are the future, you, you're going to be the future, yeah. right? And I'm always a kind of against that because why do I need to wait tomorrow to yeah. go after my dream job, to pursue my dreams, to take that leap of faith? Mm. Um, so I think, um, and I'm sure, you know, people and y- younger people um, often, they hear that all the time where they say, oh, you are the future. At first it feels good. I was like, wow, yeah. I'm going to be the future, blah, 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 blah. But it's actually a dangerous mindset to have because it prevents you from actually, going after the yeah. dream job. Yeah. Taking that leap of faith, starting your own business, because you'll always have on on the back of your mind, you'll just be like, "I'm the future anyway." Mm. But I think that's a dangerous place it's to be a, it's in. It's a trap, but they they kind of sell you the dream where totally you, know, you are the future. You, yeah, um, you know, you're contributing to the to the future of this company. Yes. And you're gonna play a big role in this man. Yeah. Hey, man, like you gotta separate yourself from the job and whether if look if your values are aligned to that yeah. job then cool but if your values don't align to that and yeah. you're just there and they're selling you this dream you gotta yeah. take a step back and realize man is it actually what i want to do totally um, and yeah. i feel yeah man look you you took a, a little break a mm. little sabbatical you know did your own thing um and i love i love i love to hear man like the fact that you know um you you quit your job mm. uh you did a little bit of yoga as, yes. as you discussed mm. um and then you took some time to obviously think and recalibrate. Mm. What um, what led you to 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 Zolo? Like you know, what was how did you come about? You know, this is my purpose. Was yeah. it something you just kind of saw? There's a market for this. Right. It aligns to my growth. Yeah. Or yeah, you know, when we talk about purpose, yeah. how did you? I think what um, is your I think all of the above. Um, but I think how Zolo came to life. Um, so I co-founded it with a friend of mine, childhood friend of mine. Yeah. We used to work at Krispy Kreme selling donuts yeah. together. That's how we met. Um, and, you know, he's like a brother to me. Um, he's, um, he's always going to be brother first, business partner second. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, in terms of my journey, I left because I was looking for, for my purpose. Um, I was looking for my why. And I think... I've always been passionate about empowering the next generation um, and passionate about, you know, providing kids the the proper tools that they need to be able to break through so that they don't go through what I went through in terms of going through that journey of um, depression Mm -hmm. and unhappiness. Um, So 
that was the big contributor when it comes to that. And then my business partner, uh, Ryan, um, he's a, he just became a father um, at that time. And his, his kind of, his viewpoint in life has changed as well. Um, you know, he's been very successful. He's been a, he's a successful entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, so he's um, operated a couple of um, tech support and repair um, shops in Sydney. So he had one in Chatswood, um, Chippendale, North Sydney. Yeah. Um, and then when he had kids, um, his um, perspective changed in terms of there has to be more than just making money. Um, so we're kind of in the same um, space in terms of we want to do more in terms of just ticking boxes and paying the bills. Don't get me wrong, though. It's important to do those things. But we, um, I think we truly believe that you can still do those things at, at the same time, create a fundamental impact to society, yeah. um, which is what we're all about. So, we, you know, we just sat down um, and we combined our expertise. You know, I came from a marketing um, and advertising background, and he's got a very strong IT um, background. And we identified the gap for, for e-waste mm -hmm. from, a, from a commercial, from a business standpoint, they have plenty of unused tech just sitting in their storage rooms. And from a, from a consumer individual standpoint, there's over 20 million unused tech sitting in Australian homes. Yeah. Um, so we, how Zolo started is literally, we just ran a campaign on Facebook. I'm gonna be very tactical. We <laughs> ran a campaign on Facebook, yeah. encouraging Australians to declutter for good. Um, it's probably not the most commercially viable thing to do where we in the, we literally went to every single household yeah. um, in Sydney and collected like phones, laptops. Um, we were at a loss from a, from a cash standpoint on that. But the reason why we did that is we just wanted to test a proof of concept. To see if there's a market. To see if there's a market, if, if it's yeah. going to be receptive. And um, it was received well. Um, and then once we've kind of gathered all the data and the insights and the learnings, We've transformed Zolo as more of a B two B business. Um, so we purely focus on helping and empowering businesses, mm -hmm. and providing them a solution to get rid of their old tech, recycle them, yep, um, prevent them from going to to landfill, and at the same time they have the opportunity to contribute towards our social impact mission, which is to connect laptops and technology to kids and communities in need. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how it all came to life, I guess. It started with just having the desire to, um, to do good to society. I know it sounds really cliche, mm -hmm. um, but I think that was like the, the core as to why we did it in the first place. Yeah. And I think it comes from experiences, man. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, it's always hard when you think about, you know, how do I find my purpose? You know, what steps do you take? It's really, it's, it's about, what have you experienced in life? Yeah. What is it that you like? What is it that you don't like? Yeah. What are you passionate about? And taking a step back and saying, yeah. at this stage of my life, does it align with what I want to do? Yeah. If it doesn't, then I need to take some steps towards that. Totally. I think that's the most practical thing we can yeah. do, right? When finding our purpose. Yeah. And I think what helped, sorry to cut you off. Yeah. And I think what helped as well was just allowing things to happen. Mm. Just literally just being there. Because oftentimes when, when we experience adversity, mm. we avoid it. Yeah. We're very, we resist. There's a lot of tension. But I think what I've learned personally within, throughout this, the, the journey that I was in is, I just welcomed all the um, you all say the yes to things, man. Yes, yeah. I welcome you know even if I was having a bad day and you know I wasn't myself, mm -hmm. I just sat there and just articulated. All right, why am I feeling this way? Um, so I think um, you have to be vulnerable and you have you just have to surrender to what is, mm -hmm. to whatever is being thrown at you, emotionally, physically, whatever it may be. Um, and not resist from it at all because those are like the, the little pockets of lessons that you kind of need to acknowledge. It's and opportunity learn. as well. Yes. It's opportunity. Um, so through you know through those adversity and obstacles that I was in, I was able to kind of th um, think about what's really important for me. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's been a it's been an ongoing journey. I'm not saying that I've kind of figured it out now. You know, I'm still in that journey, and yeah. that's the beauty of life that we that we live in. We we face different obstacles, and those obstacles just allow us to become better versions of yeah. ourselves. Hundred percent. I feel yeah. like that's saying yes to things is yeah. very important um, because it opens doors, man. Totally, it, it opens yeah. doors to people you never spoken to, opens yeah. to tasks that you haven't done, and mm. 
it'll give you a new perspective on life, but also spark some 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 sort of idea in your yes. brain, right? Like, yeah. Sometimes you say yes, it won't spark anything, but some that one point where it does, yeah. That's something that, like, oh shit, that's a business idea. Oh, yes. That's, that's something that I can do. I, I really yeah. like doing, right? Yeah. I can tap into that. So, yes. Interesting to say, man. Like, um, saying yes to things opens pockets to opportunities. Mm. Um, and just for for Zolo, man. Um. You know, e-waste is something that is just a—it's just wastage, and it's just things that are just going that is not being recycled and you know given to communities that you mm. know, need it. Um, and I'm, you know, we're glad that you know Zolo is on a mission to do that, recycle, provide uh, you know access for for communities that don't have mm. have that. Um, so you know, uh, two two part question is one, you know, what contributes to the cycle of social disadvantage because that's obviously what Zola is trying to mm. solve and to what areas uh, or what communities is Zola currently covering right now? Yeah, yeah, totally. I think um, the, the first question is just um, opportunity, mm. right? I think, um, I think there's an opportunity to kind of promote having equal opportunity, whatever it may be, um, because I truly believe that everyone is capable regardless of your race, background, wherever you came from, everyone is capable of doing something great. Um, but the barrier is always going to be opportunity. Opportunity could be not having the tools. Mm -hmm. Opportunity could be not being in an environment where they have a lot of people empowering them, right? Um, so those are like the little pockets of opportunities that are not, um, unfortunately, not everyone has it. Um, so I think it's just a matter of doing our part through technology, not saying that we provide opportunities full stop, yep. you know, I think we, um, we giving some them access to the information, giving them access to information, because I think technology is always going to be the entry point, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, online learning during COVID, um, everyone was heavily reliant on tech. Yeah. Um, so and unfortunately, some communities in Sydney, um, there was a shortage in um, in technology. Some, some, I think, some in a household, uh, two kids are sharing one laptop for for online learning, which is um, which is very alarming. Mm -hmm. And that was actually one of the the stats that um, that kind of pushed us. Oh, we have to do something about this. Um, and I think yeah, just the um, the notion of the, the digital divide that we experience. Um, is something that we want to address. Mm. And we we were confident that we we can address it based on our capacity and expertise. So hence why we um we pursued it. So yeah. Interesting man. And and um you know uh, what sort of communities did you identify that had this lack of um, access to hardware? And, right, yes. You know, and which communities are those that you can't remember? Yeah, so we partnered with um, Women's and Girls Emergency Center. So they're our charity partner. They're based in, uh, based in Redfern. Mm -hmm. So basically they provide homes to victims of domestic violence. Um, so I specifically pursued that, um, that charity mm -hmm. because it's, um, it's close to heart. And that's kind of like our approach as well with our partnerships, not just from a charity standpoint, but the, the businesses that we work with, I think it needs to be genuine um, for me personally and something that Ryan and I are quite passionate about. Um, so the reason why we kind of pursued um, the, the Women's and Girls Emergency Center because I'm a product of female leadership. Mm. Um, my my dad passed away when I was 16, so I was literally raised by a single mom. Um, and I came from an industry in marketing where it's heavily dominated by female leaders. Um, all my managers were female. So, uh, yeah, I'm a product of female leadership. So, and I'm very proud of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, one of the things for me is I need to... I need to give back, mm -hmm. you know, to to those who kind of paved the way and invested time in me. So I specifically pursue them because I true what they're trying to do um, and their mission resonates with me completely. Um, so yeah, the, the, those are the communities that um, that we specifically focus on is through our charity partner. Nice we man. don't do it ourselves. We're not the experts in community outreach. Yeah. So we we partner with the experts, I suppose. Nice. Uh, yeah. All right, and um, you know that's that's I mean that's one startup, and that's a great thing that you're doing for positive social impact. Um, before we even get to O Jazz, which is a whole other beast that you're working <laughs> on, right? Um, you know what um, to the consumers or to the audience that's listening to this, what can they do 
practically to help Zolo? Um, just to get the word out there, number one. Um, I think, you know, just everyone everyone has the capacity to somehow help. It doesn't necessarily need to be for Zolo. Mm -hmm. um, but I think from a, from a Zolo standpoint, it's just being conscious of how we consume. Yeah. Um, being conscious of how we consume technology, how we, you know, I think we're, we're in a day and age where we have to get the latest all, every single time. And it's just a matter of having a level of awareness and consciousness around implications of getting new stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not being an advocate of, and I'm not judging people who get the new phone every single year. Just recycle you know, after that. Though. Just, <laughs> just donate it to Zola. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just being conscious and aware. And um, I think that's, um, that's, that's the that's what we can do. That's yeah. the part that matters is just having a level of awareness and consciousness. Awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah, man. So look, um, for people who are listening, if you're a consumer, you're getting a new phone, you're getting a new laptop, uh, make sure you visit Zolo. Uh, you know, donate as much as you can. Uh, these guys are doing great work uh, for for society and just communities as well. And if you're a business, definitely reach out to them as well. Uh, you know, if a lot of you guys in procurement and IT definitely have a lot of just laptops and hardware just sitting there. So reach out to Zolo um, and just partner with them. And you know, these guys, you know, Recycle and, and contribute to society as well. So, um, yeah, hopefully that that's going to drive Thank the traffic. You. And, and, and yeah, and we'll check out Google Analytics. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. But that's that's a good thing. Now, OJAS. Now, this is something that's really interesting, right? Yeah. Uh, first off, jazz music. Yes. Uh, is something that is you know. A lot of kids from where we come from probably don't listen to jazz, and there is yeah. a little pockets of it. But yeah. I think. Jazz is a is a genre in, within itself where um, it's great to diversify your music taste. Mm. Now, now, two, um, there's a lot of artists out there that require uh, help, and in terms of you know we're moving towards a, a time where independence and having ownership in your music yeah. and your art is such yes. a big thing, right? Yeah. So, can you explain what O Jazz is as a business? Uh, what your role is there and yeah, just tell us about yeah the mission of that. Yeah, totally. We'd love to. Um, o Jazz is a streaming platform for for live jazz music. Um, it's a, basically like Netflix for jazz. You know, we um, we deliver over two hundred shows per year from the iconic clubs all over the world, um, and you can stream it on your phone, your laptop, TV, whatever it may be, wherever you want and whenever you are. Um, so we partner we partner with clubs in in New York, London, Spain. Australia, we have two in in Australia, um, and we yeah we we kind of live stream and the the shows directly from those clubs. Um, so it gives um, the consumers the opportunity to consume the the influ the different cultural influences of jazz, and at the same time travel the world of jazz. That's one of our marketing components. Is we're more than just a streaming platform. We actually provide the culture. We bring to life the culture, the influences. And also the artists as well, because um, I think what I've learned um, throughout this journey is there are different pockets of influences of jazz and the music that we are listening to right now. You know, the mainstream music like the Kanye's of the world, all influenced by jazz. Mm -hmm. um, and the beauty behind it is you, you get to see the grassroots of where it all began um, and, you know, get to. Um, and what I'm most excited about and the reason why I jumped into this venture is because of the mission of the uh, the Company. So I mentioned earlier that we are more than a streaming app because um, we believe that we are. So we provide a platform of opportunity where uh, we create a stage for artists to, to thrive and grow. So what that means is the 35% uh, of what we make will be connected to artists, clubs, and performers, giving them a whole new revenue stream for them to be able to, to hone in and really pursue the, the craft that they're in. Um, I think one thing that I've learned is, you know, I think I was never a jazz fan. Mm -hmm. And I think in terms of my level of knowledge in the arts industry, arts and music industry, I would say it was a, it was, it was a sound knowledge, but now, um, you know, working on it, I'm kind of into the detail now. But before I think when someone says musician, I would always think of the mainstream artist, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. Taylor Swift, <laughs> Justin Bieber. Um, but I think um, it's a, it's a whole new industry in terms of there are a lot of people that just want to make it. Mm -hmm. um, and I had the opportunity to listen to their stories, um, to get to know them, and I've learned a lot from them. So these are your musicians that you know they play at a club on a Saturday and they 
work at a cafe on weekdays. Yeah. And, you know, they, tr they do that because just to get by. But their passion is to perform, right? Um, and th we cater to those people, to those artists. Um, we want to make sure that we position them to succeed. Um, part of the onboarding process when we have a show is I get to I have the opportunity to get to talk to the artist. Um, and I think one of the things that we want to do is we want to empower them to be able to promote themselves as artists. Because I think that's one thing that's lacking at the moment based on our experience um, is they have the talent, they can perform, they have the passion. But in terms of just um, promoting themselves, um, that's um, that's one thing that's a huge opportunity for us to tap into in terms of helping them. So those are one of the things that I'm kind of excited about um, in terms of um, in terms of my role. So I have the honor of being the the chief marketing officer for for O Jazz, um, and essentially my responsibility is just to drive awareness of you know, the mission, who we are and what we're trying to do, yep. um, get people to buy into and subscribe um, and just create a community of um, of individuals that just want to empower one another. Doesn't You don't need to be a jazz fan yep. to be a part of the community. I think the message that we are trying to portray is, number one, we have to appreciate art, the value of art. I think for me, I was guilty of this where um, I would just automatically assume that music, art should be for free just because we're kind of accustomed to that and how we consume media nowadays is it's on our fingertips, you know. Yeah. Um, but I was, um, I think I had to go through this awareness component where they put in a lot of work to deliver just one product and it's similar to business, you know, they deliver something for this one, it's art. Um, so I think that was a good, um, that was a good learning for me in terms of just appreciating the integrity behind um, the process, the, process yeah. and the creativity. Um, and yeah, I think um, I'm glad that, um, that I'm more aware mm. of that and I appreciate it yeah. Um, because yeah, I think, um, it is a whole new consumer behavior exercise that needs to change as well yeah. in terms of how your day-to-day -day consumers, how they perceive art, how they perceive music, um, whatever it may be. I think the value needs to be mm. front, right, and center. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, OJazz's mission is obviously empowering artists, uh, you know, specifically you know, jazz artists to uh, to be promoted and be recognized for their work and also adding them uh, a revenue stream but they can obviously you know, be rewarded for the work that they put in, right? Yes. Um, now, can you tell us more about, you know, obviously that's helping, um, it's a two, it's a two uh, market, it's a two market um, where you got one, which is the artist and you're yes. on their side. Yeah. Now, you know, for a venue, right? Yeah. You know, what sort of um, value do you want to communicate to um, to these venues, you know, how is that going to help them bring an artist over? Yeah. Having a live stream, what does that do for their business? You know, what's the business model looking like? Yeah, totally. Uh, I think um, I love working with the clubs um, because you, I get to experience different culture. There's plenty of diversity, which is awesome. So it's good. Um, so I think what we do for the clubs is we work with a club in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Someone in Barcelona can see all that. Yeah. the experience so it's good from a t tourism standpoint where oh my goodness this is the culture of tokyo these are the influences of tokyo from a jazz perspective so i think part of um, our production execution is we bring those little pockets of tokyo to life mm -hmm. so it's not just you know a live stream of music we tap into the culture we tap into the audience um it's, it's a feeling as if you're sitting in a club in tokyo but you're in sydney so I think um, that's one of the things that we want to kind of encourage as well is to, number one, help the clubs to get more people coming into the clubs yeah. um, and raising awareness of who they are, what they're trying to achieve. Um, because I think at the moment for them, the most important thing is just foot traffic. Mm. And that's something that we're where we can help because, number one, we provide the awareness through our platform, through our community. Um, and it allows international eyeballs to, you know, to be a part of it as well. They, they can see what's happening in Tokyo. They can see what what's happening in Sydney if you're in Tokyo. So it's um, something that I'm still kind of figuring out in terms of what's the best way to execute it. Mm -hmm. um, 
I suppose the beauty in startups is we're very lean. <laughs> <laughs> I may be the CMO, but I do all the stuff. <laughs> yeah, you're wearing every, all the hats, man. Yeah. That's, that's part of startup yeah. life, man. Um, so I think, uh, and it's, yeah, I think for me, it's just how can I maximize that, mm. what I just said in terms of the, 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 the bartender working in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Who's um, who's very flamboyant and entertaining? Yeah. How can we bring that to life in a way that's gonna get awareness and traction from someone watching in Spain? Um, so yeah, just bringing to life the different cultures, just connecting different parts of the world. To exactly. Each other, right? Yeah. So I think yeah, if we summarize the values, you know, for artists is yeah. the fact that you know you're being empowered, you have another revenue stream, you're being recognized for your work that you put in. Uh, and for the venues, you bring traffic, you bring yes. recognition, uh, and just you know, free press to these yeah. guys. Where you know, uh, you know, if I was to go in Turkey, I wouldn't know that there's a venue out there that plays jazz. Right, yeah. I can go there. Yeah, uh, so that's awesome, man. Um, I feel like you know, going to more of a personal view as well, where uh, I mean, your Instagram caption was, was something yeah. that struck out to me. Um, where it says the school system is outdated <laughs> now you know every, i got a lot of views on the school yeah. system of how it can be done better but yeah. um i'd love to get from your perspective man what do you mean by that when yeah. you say the school system is outdated what's wrong with it how's it broken um first of all this, that topic is like a passion point of mine and i can go all day just talking about it yeah um and i believe it's outdated um, and there's a huge opportunity to kind of reinvent the school system. And I think it starts with truly understanding the students, mm. right? Because not everyone's the same. I think the beauty behind life is, you know, we get to share it with one another. We get to grow together. Um, but at the same time, France is different from Tommy, yeah. right? In terms of, but the school system is a blanket approach where, all right, start year seven, Work your way up to year 12. You got to make sure you get a high ATAR to get into uni. Yeah. And then once you get into uni, you got to get an internship and then get out of that internship and get a full-time job. Yeah. So that's like the um, the blanket approach from the moment you step foot into a, to a school. That's kind of like the milestones that you mm -hmm. need to hit, which is great because you have a view of, all right, this is what I need to do. But what if that person based on, you know, maybe just based on how that student grew up, his personality, how is, um, like, you know, just who he is as an individual, who he or she is as an individual, um, is not equipped for the, the typical approach where you have to get a high ATAR, get into university, get an internship, and then get out of an internship it's and like get a, a full time like role. Just like you're templatizing the whole thing. Exactly. Like you're templatizing and, the kid. And um, it prevents um, students from actually breaking, breaking through. Mm. Um, and I think the reason why I'm super passionate about it, because I didn't do well at school. Mm. Um, and that kind of gave, and I think that's when all the, all the mental health issues that I went through, it all stemmed from that because I wasn't confident about myself. Yeah. And the fact that I was, I was getting mediocre grades and I felt, you know, I just felt like I was very incompetent mm. and I've lost confidence during my, my school days. Um, I just wanted to play basketball, you know, <laughs> just wanted to play basketball, go home, go back to school, play basketball. So that was like, that was it for me. But well, apparently, you know, you gotta, you gotta get high marks. Um, but I do understand the notion of striving to get high marks because it teaches you discipline. Yeah. Um, but I never understood why I have to get high marks. Mm. Um, so I think um, in terms of why it's outdated, I think it needs to cater to a kid who wants to be an entrepreneur. Um, it also needs to raise awareness around what happens outside the real world as well. Mm. Um, one of the things that I struggle with um, when I... You know, my first day at the real world was how to budget, mm. um, how to deal with different personalities, um, having empathy. So those skills that you need every single day, they I, I never they never taught that to me at school. I had to yeah. learn that the hard way. You know, I learned that when I was 25, yeah. how to budget, how to deal with different personalities, <laughs> yeah. how to communicate properly, yeah. how to listen. Um, but I know how to do algebra. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not applicable most of my life. I know. Yeah, man. Yeah. So I think just those basic life skills, I think, um, needs to be dialed up. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe they are doing that now. 
Um, but, you know, this is just based from my experience, and I'm sure you can resonate with that, too. Yeah. Um, there's just an opportunity to kind of inject more real-life skills, providing options in terms of different pathways. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's ultimately up to the kid to do whatever he or she wants to do. Yeah, I feel like, um, yeah, same as, same as yeah. me, man. I, when I was in school, I had mediocre grades. Yeah. I didn't really care too much about a lot of these topics. Um and I feel like you had to kind of have to find my own way of, yeah. of how to strive. So yeah. 100% resonate with you there. Now, you're probably, you know, putting you on the spot here, but, um, you know, if you were, um, yeah, let's say if you were, you know, head of education or something, right? <gasps> yeah. You know, what reforms would you do, you know, sp- sp- yeah. specifically? Any sort of idea, and you know, how would you, yeah. you know, fix all your courses or whatever? What reforms would you make? Okay. First of all, I think I don't have the capacity to become a head of education, <laughs> yeah. but this, uh, this is going to be just based on my experience um, and based on what I know. I'm not saying I'm an expert when it comes to education. It's just, you know, I'm just reflecting on, oh, I wish I did that. Yeah. I so see. on and so forth. So just to get that out of the way. Yeah. Um, so I think... Um, I think freedom mm. is the first thing. And when I say freedom is giving the, the student an option to identify different pathways to what, whatever it is that they want to do. Um, and how the school system can contribute towards that is just exposure, mm. exposure to different pathways. You don't need to, um, you don't need to go to university. Uh, I know that could be very controversial. Um, and sometimes you just need to learn life skills, mm. um, what, kind of like what I mentioned before. So I think starting starting with that, and not being judged purely on grades. Yeah. Right. Because I, yeah, for me, get, I was getting mediocre grades, and I automatically assumed that I'm gonna be a, you know, I'm not gonna go anywhere in life just because I didn't get full marks. Yeah. Um, so I think just positioning that. Um, being able to articulate and identify if the student is getting mediocre grades or low grades, there should be a different kind of curriculum for those particular students. It's not a blanket approach um, because I think it's a blanket approach at the moment where you got to learn X, Y, Z, yep. whatever, you know, and if you get X, Y, Z results, you're still going to learn X, Y, Z. It shouldn't be X, Y, Z across the board. Um, for someone, you know, I think for someone who's re- who really excels, it's for them. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm jealous because it wasn't for me. And I kind of wish I understood that at a young age where this is, you know, the, the school, you know, getting high grades, getting a high HSC is what, it's, what it should be. But I never understood the reason behind that, mm. to be honest. But, um, yeah, just giving an option to, to those who, um, who's kind of rebelling to the system, to the school system. Because yeah. I rebelled to the school system where I don't want to do my homework, yeah. you know, um, sit at the back of the class, so on and so forth. Just giving them an option because mm-hmm. I think everyone has the opportunity to become, everyone has the opportunity to become great. Mm-hmm. And it's just a matter of instilling that and providing opportunities to kind of navigate through that journey of greatness, yeah. they say. I think it's, yeah, I think. Yeah. Having a standardized, I mean, look, it's it's hard because how do you scale uh, customization or tailoring to, to kids yeah. uh, as opposed to making it easy and standardizing, yeah. right? So yeah. I 100%, 100% understand, you know, the difficulty in that, but that is a gap that is outdated where, yeah. you know, the more that we, uh, you know, every year passes by, I just see kids just rebelling. I see kids that just want to do their own thing and right. they probably yeah. fall into paths that they don't want to fall yeah. into or they don't see themselves into. So I 100% agree with you that there needs to be uh, a system where you tailor to these kids. Mm. Um, an interesting one is um, uh, my, my girlfriend told me about this, is Montessori yeah. Academies. What's that? Montessori oh, Academies. Yeah. So these are schools that tailor to each of the kids. They, wow. they let the kid, um, yeah, they test out the kids, I guess, their skills and yeah. their, their learning path. Yeah. And, they realize, oh shit, this kid's actually really good at basketball. Yeah. Oh shit, this kid's really good at maths right. or English or arts. Yeah. And then they hone into that skill yeah. so that um, they really just become experts in that. Yeah. And you know, that's driving passion. That's helping start, you know, create, uh, yeah. be more creative in that space. So, um, but to Canada is something that's interesting. I don't know how much yeah. it costs, but uh, that is something yeah. definitely we should, we should look into. Yeah, I love how you mentioned that. Though it kind of unlocked an idea or an insight. 
ultimately up to the parents at the end of the day. Up to the parents. Um, again, I mentioned earlier that I grew up in a very conservative household where the degree is like the holy grail. Yeah. Um, and I think I was kind of, you know, I was stuck in that system. My To this day, my mom doesn't understand what I do for work. <laughs> to this day. Yeah. Um, you know, she was worried when I quit my job um, because it's not normal. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not working in nine to five. Um, but I think, yeah, it starts with the um, it starts with the parents where you have to really know what your kid wants to do in life, mm. w- what their personality is and not get too confined on the on the system. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Because I just wanted to, like I said, like, I just wanted to play basketball. Could have made it to the NBA. <laughs> Shooting, th- I can make corner threes, you know. Yeah. If I just kept doing that, but I did it. Yeah, I'm but, but, but you know. would, have, would have helped you hit some corners. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I think, um, I think you, know, uh, you know, almost wrapping up. I think uh, in terms of practical steps, you know, because you, you some of it came from a nine to five. Yes, you now uh, establish a startup Zola and also working in a startup as a CMO as well for OJAZ and you're wearing a lot of hats. Um, you know, if leaving the information out there for, for those who do want to have ownership and you know, establish a startup, right? Yeah. First is obviously finding your passion and yeah. finding the market you actually want to do. But um, you know, can you outline, you know, if you were to start a startup from scratch, yeah. you know, what would be the steps? What's the thought process you yeah. would share? Uh, what steps would you outline and you know, how yeah. do you set milestones? Of course. Know, how would you do it practically? Yeah, I think the first thing is um, before all the milestones would be environment. The environment that you're in is very important. So it's the people you associate yourself with, the people you hang out with, and the people you gain wisdom from. Um, so that was like the first thing that I, um, that I took in terms of, all right, I decluttered some people. I've lost a lot of friends, um, and I was fine with that because I had that level of awareness where I have one goal in mind, which is to become an entrepreneur, and I know the things that I need to do, and one of them is just making sure that I cultivate an environment where I'm thriving. So that's number one. Um, the second thing is, from a, from a startup perspective, is what's the problem that you're trying to solve um, you know, I think oftentimes we are, uh, for, you know, I was putting my hand up here. I just want to make money, you know, yeah. and money is important because it, it unlocks opportunities. But I think in order for a startup or a business or f- for an individual to be successful is to identify what problem that you are solving and how can you make someone's life better? Um, so that's the second one. And then I think the third one would be, um, I think... I think we are in this world to to have a level of impact, a positive impact to someone or something. It's just finding that how can you create or contribute a fundamental impact to society based on the skills and expertise that you have. Um, I think those are like the, the top three things that I've kind of considered. So environment, mentors are very important. Um, the people you hang out with, you associate yourself with and how you get wisdom. And then the second one is making sure that you solve a customer problem Mm -hmm. um, and trying to fill in the gaps in terms of if I solve X problem, um, it has a commercial benefit. Mm -hmm. So it's being able to kind of bring all those pieces together. And then the last one is, um, what was the last one? I can't remember what the last one was. I think the last one was, um, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think carry on to that, man. I think yeah. it's um, um, obviously f- associating with the people that you want to align with, right? Totally. You want to align yeah. with like beyond just a friendship, but like if this person shares the same values as me, shares yeah. the same vision because you have to be on the same page. Yeah. So finding the right people because... Um, I mean, even starting a startup, man, because you guys are going to be sharing equity. Yeah. You want someone who has the ownership mentality totally, with you yeah. and aligns with that yeah. vision. Two is finding a purpose and uh, yeah. and seeing whether there's a there's a market for that as well as you're passionate yeah. for that. And uh, three is obviously, I think, um, yeah, a pr- proof of concept. You gotta yeah. you gotta test that that, that idea yeah. out before it, totally. if it works, yeah. then you can yes. scale. If it yes. doesn't, then yeah. back to the drawing board. Yeah, goals. and I think just have fun throughout the process mm. is very important. Um, and having fun in the midst of pressure is very critical as well. And I think um, one of that's 
one of the things that I like about our jazz is I'm, I'm applying all the stuff that I learned from Zolo. Yeah. And I think from Zola, I was so stressed out because yeah. that was like my first rodeo. Um, and then I've lost track of the little things, you know. And looking back at it, did I stress out on that, you know? <laughs> and that's why my approach at Jazz is way different now in terms of I'm really enjoying it. And you can tell from the output. And it, it's also contagious as well. I'm conscious that I'm working with other people now for Jazz, and And I think I see it as my responsibility to to make sure that I lead by example. Mm -hmm. um, my action would influence other people's actions too. Yep. So I'm always mindful of that and making sure that, yes, it's a high pressure situation, but um, we're a bunch of creative individuals where sometimes creative people don't respond well to pressure and it, it impacts the output of the creativity. So it's just being empathetic and just um, kind of like being the, the Zen person at the same time, getting stuff done. Yeah, um, yeah. I feel like yeah, it's if you guys are align the same vision and, and you yeah. face adversity, but you love what you do, then it's, yeah, if you really love it and you're actually passionate about, it, yeah. you're, gonna, you're gonna go through the adversity and, and you're gonna get yeah. through it, right? And I think um, what I was gonna say, man, damn, I forgot. It <laughs> um, yeah, I think doing a startup man like even if you fail and the startup yeah. fails it's the process that you're learning yes. so that you know the next startup yeah. i'm going to do in the next business if i yeah. try again i know not to take that yeah. path i know that this is the best practice yeah. i know that you know totally. this the people i should talk to yeah so it's it's a process where you have to learn rather than the yeah. outcome and that totally. leads to the outcome right and then i think um one thing that might hit a nerve to some people is don't start a startup just so you can put it on your instagram story there's a lot of people like that <laughs> um i used to be like that yeah um and i think it and as part of my growth and um, maturity journey, I guess, I was able to let go of that because mm. I think before that was like the priority. I just wanted to prove other people wrong. Um, you know, I was heavily putting everything on social media, but I feel like ever since I've kind of um, stopped doing that, mm -hmm. Um, that's where I've noticed results. Yeah. I and I like literally do not care. I just care. I, like I'm so laser focused on what, you know, the, the outcomes that we're trying to achieve and also sticking to the company mission, um, you know, for our jazz is to empower individuals all over the world. Um, sticking to that. Oftentimes we lose track of the mission during the doing, yeah. du du during the delivering of stuff, mm -hmm. but it's good to kind of make sure that, all right, this is why we're doing it in the first place, to empower an artist in Tokyo to continue to perform. Let's stick to that despite the, the obstacles and the adversities because yeah. that's why we did it in the first place. Yeah, I think, yeah, staying aligned to, to it before you do a startup, just be really aligned with what you want to do uh, instead of just for the sake of doing a startup. Yeah. Right? Um, all right, man, before we wrap up, um, I always ask this question. Yes. Three books that you would recommend uh, to the audience that they can read on? Uh, oof, love reading books, but just three? Just three, just the title. First one, I just read this, um, is Shoe Dog. Shoe Dog. Uh, uh, by Phil Knight, yeah. Nike founder. I think that is a great articulation of like the journey of starting a business from scratch to where it is right now. Um, that resonated well with me in terms of the early stages of, you know, Phil Knight when he was, you know, fresh out of university. Um, and then he traveled the world um, and he just wanted to challenge the system, right? Um, so that, re that book re really resonated well with me and it gave me confidence as well to kind of know, oh shit, we're on the right track here because journey is kind of similar. I'm not saying we're going to be the next psyche, but um, in terms of just the growth and the journey and the perception, I think um, that ticks all the boxes. Um, the second one is um, The Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle. I um, hope I pronounce his name right. Um, <laughs> so that's just all about being present, being in the present moment. Um, and I think, you know, for an entrepreneur, that's kind of important to, to thing to have is focus on the now, focus on the present time, surrender to it, um, and then just enjoy the journey. So that taught me how to be grounded and just be present, which is the most important thing, regardless if you're not a not an entrepreneur i guess um and then the third one is start with why uh, by simon sinek um i think marketers would heavily benefit from that book um i think it's a good sales book as well because oftentimes we just tell them 
this is what I do. Mm. But I think apparently the best, well, what I've learned from the book is the best approach is to start with why you're doing it in the first place, how you're doing it, and then what it is that you're actually doing. That's kind of like the the formula in terms of you know for pitches. I, I used to did a lot of I did a lot of pitches for for Zolo. Um, we're doing we did some for for O Jazz, and that kind of book helped me just to be able to just um, structure what it is that we're trying to um, convey. Yeah, it's good for um, communicate. It's a good communication book yeah. to be able to articulate your thoughts in a way that's going to be effective, and it's going to resonate to your target audience. So shoe dog Nike. The Nike book, uh, Power of Now, and um, Start With Why. Awesome. In my top three. All right, guys. Well, look, I appreciate you for, for coming Thank you. up and, and you know, sharing your insight. Uh, hopefully, that's been you know useful advice for the audience. And, um, you know, stay tuned. Like I said, Small Talk is going to be focusing on bringing this information and the guests that are relevant to these topics to help you uh, become the next leaders of your generation and, and, and onwards. So... Appreciate you guys for jumping on and uh, listening to us. And uh, friends, thanks for coming on. And uh, thank you. See you next time, man. See you, man. <laughs>